Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Felder, Vice President for Operations of the Eisenhower Foundation, and I welcome you to this session titled, How Can the Performing and Visual Arts Create New Will to Reduce White Privilege? <clears throat> Thank you to the Privilege Institute and Dr. Moore for providing a platform where we can discuss this topic. I think we're ready to go. So let's jump right into our session with the presentation from Dr. Alan Curtis, President and CEO of the Eisenhower Foundation. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, thank you to Jenny Oliver, uh, Dr. Moore and the Pri Privilege Institute uh, for this opportunity. Um, with your indulgence today, I'd like to continue the discussion we actually had last year uh, at the White Privilege Conference uh, when we had really powerful uh, feedback uh, on the Kerner Commission's recommendations to reduce white privilege. Um, this morning, I will make uh, a brief presentation. Um, following that, uh, we'll show some video clips from several really powerful visionaries uh, and then open the session for uh, your uh, feedback and criticism in, in our discussion, which we, which we really need uh, in terms of uh, uh, pursuing uh, the ideas that I want to lay out. Um, during uh, the 1960s, uh, there were over 150 protests in America, uh, urban protests, and those of us of a certain age remember Watts and Detroit and Newark, whites tended to call the uh, disturbances riots, people of color called them protests. The same differences in framing, uh, I think, held, held true in 2020 after uh, the killings of uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. In response to the 60s protests, President Lyndon Johnson uh, formed the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, known as the Kerner Commission. Uh, the, uh, its chair, uh, Kerner of Illinois. Most of the members of the uh, commission were privileged white men who bore the imprimatur of the white establishment, yet uh, a majority of the Kerner commissioners uh, concluded in 1968 uh, that the underlying cause of the protests was uh, white racism. Um, the Mantle paperback of the Kerner report uh, back then sold over 2 million copies, which was an unheard of uh, sales volume uh, at, at, at the time for a, a federal uh, publication. The uh, commission asserted, uh, and I quote, it's time to make good the promises of American democracy to all citizens, urban and rural, black and white, Spanish surname, American Indian, and every minority group. And I suggest to you it is still time uh, in 2022. Um, with our national advisory panel, um, uh, composed of people like Marion Wright Edelman and Linda Darling Hammond, um, we at the Eisenhower Foundation uh, published uh, Healing Our Divided Society uh, recently, uh, which is our 50 year update. Uh, uh, we worked with Temple University Press and we concluded uh, that America has made relatively uh, little progress uh, since Kerner in reducing racial injustice, economic inequality, and poverty, and in many ways uh, we have gone backwards. For example, uh, since the Kerner Commission, public school segregation and mass incarceration of people of color have increased. Neo-Nazis have made their statements and inflicted uh, deaths in Charlottesville. White supremacists have invaded the Capitol building, income inequality, wealth inequality, and deep poverty have increased. The pandemic has made things disproportionately worse for people of color. At the same time, we have learned a great deal uh, about policy that works and policy that doesn't since uh, the current commission 50 years ago. Today, for example, what works is illustrated by vaccination, Keynesian investments and living wages, child tax credits, strengthened labor unions, Head Start, preschool, equity and public school finance, community schools, proven housing mobility models uh, that uh, create residential and school integration, de-incarceration, and genuine partnerships between nonprofit community organizations and police. Uh, what doesn't work is illustrated uh, 
few examples by anti-vaxxing rhetoric, indifference to the unequal distribution of prosperity, trickle-down supply-side economics and neoliberalism, zero-tolerance policing, and false 1980s rhetoric on the government being the problem. Uh, yet, since the current commission, um, we haven't scaled up what works and we haven't scaled down what doesn't work. Part of the reason for that is a significant number of Americans accept policy based on dogma and supposition rather than policy based on evidence uh, and science. Uh, we need, I suggest, a strategy for how to reverse that unhealthy reality. But the overriding reason uh, for lack of sustained progress is that America still does not have what the current commission called new will to reverse racial injustice, economic inequality, and poverty. How then we are asking, uh, can we create a new will today? It's a difficult question to answer, but arguably right now, at this point in time, the most significant strategy for creating new will uh, probably is to pass voting rights legislation and to reverse voter suppression. And we need, I suggest, to ask how the visual arts, museums, and the performing arts, and related ins institutions can better visualize, amplify, and facilitate current priorities in a way that generates a new will among the American people. What has our foundation found this past year in virtual events that have explored Kerner, the arts, culture, and new will? That's really the essence of our session today. When I want to recall some of the events we've had uh, that build up to today. Uh, one of our first events was a panel with directors of the Smithsonian Institution's African American Latino American Indian Museums uh, in Washington. Um, the directors, the Smithsonian directors, were really enthusiastic about uh, Kerner and, and healing, and they said it was important for prestigious <clears throat> national cultural institutions to target significant resources in generating new will. Uh, they said that they really had no choice but to be activists and engaged during the present moment of American and world history. Through this Smithsonian Reckoning Initiative, which is called Our Shared Future, the Smithsonian Museum Directors are reaching out to work with museums at the grassroots. It was pointed out to us by the Smithsonian folks that uh, there are more local museums and related institutions in America than McDonald's and Starbucks combined. We, we then, following the Smithsonian uh, event, we held a, a Kerner event that included activist artists and activist art gallery directors. The, events, uh, also, the event also included the director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, MoMA, uh, the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and the director of the Boston Fine Arts uh, Museum all of these were senior white men, uh, and uh, these uh, three uh, museum directors thought it was asking too much for traditional art museums to create new will, though they did think that tra traditional art museums could create a catalytic platform for artists. However, another panelist, uh, activist artist Hank Willis Thomas, disagreed with the museum directors. He advocated policy more in sync with the advocacy of the Smithsonian director. Mr. Thomas discussed four freedoms, uh, his artist run nonprofit organization. Four freedoms works to communicate how money, power, art, commerce, and education, as well as the public sector, interrelate. The Four Freedoms Organization has collaborated with artists in, in all the states uh, to create activist public art billboards along highways and exhibitions uh, that are related to the billboards uh, that cover issues like <clears throat> voting rights, 
campaign finance reform, gun control, racism, gender equality, uh, and freedom of expression. Uh, his uh, um, Make America Great Public Art billboard uh, was shown at the Museum of uh, Modern Art in New York. Uh, construction of such public art billboards in locations across the country frequently is timed uh, uh, by Hank uh, with town meetings uh, nearby the billboards and related events to discuss public policy issues uh, featured on the billboards. Mr. Thomas uh, stressed that people who have the income to influence public policy often have the income to shape art and much of that income is based on commerce. He believes that the perpetual mission of museums really should be to sustain meaningful public policy change. So there was a real interesting dialogue between the museum directors and the artists. And uh, we want to show you now uh, more about what uh, the artist, Hank Willis uh, Thomas said during our event. have been influential in my work, in my life, my career. And I am just uh, grateful for the context of this conversation. Um, I must be transparent that I am a member of MoMA's uh, trustee committee on education and um, consider myself a friend of Glenn and his daughter, Alexis, who curated an exhibition of mine, uh, of my work, I think six or seven years ago. So I'm biased. <laughs> um, Pamela Joyner has been, I think, one of the most game-changing art collectors in uh, this century. And uh, Nicola has been one of my biggest advocates and supporters and has also So it's been an incredible game changer through her uh, consulting and uh, mentoring of artists. Um, I have to say that I fundamentally disagree with the three museum directors, though. <laughs> um, and I have to start with the background of my mother's MoMA uh, membership card in 1979. I know for a fact if it weren't for that uh acceptance and the education that she got as a young african-american woman uh artist uh that i wouldn't be here and <laughs> by default we wouldn't be here <laughs> um my mother was uh, her name is ever willis she's a curator art historian who worked at schomburg center for researching art and black culture uh for uh to almost two decades uh, after which she worked at what was then called the African American Museum Project at the Smithsonian, which we now refer to as the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And so I grew up actually in these institutions, um, actually in the archives, understanding uh, the power of art to change and shape society. And I believe that all art is political. I don't believe it has to look political to be political. Ellsworth Kelly uh, is a political artist in my in, in my position and um, for my position, uh, but I also had experiences at uh, at the at the Met uh, where there was Kerry James Marshall's Mastery Exhibition, which uh, was groundbreaking and I would say earth shattering for the art for the art world, but also especially the art market, which is highly political when a black artist who's living can sell a painting for over $20 million, that does reshape the way in which we understand the value of images of black people and the work of black artists. Uh, at the Museum of Fine Art uh, Boston, I got the privilege of seeing 
an exhibition by Gordon Parks called uh, Back to Fort Scott, which was a very small but really profound exhibition for me where I began to understand a different element of artists who I greatly respect's work. Um, and uh, of course, there's the, the Whitney's Black Male Exhibition, which was curated by Thelma Golden, which um, was highly controversial at the time, but I think it paved the way for so much of the work we see today. Um, and when it comes bringing it back to MoMA, I, I had the privilege with my collaboration for Freedoms in, uh, when was that? In 2017, in 2016, we put up this billboard in Mississippi that said, make America great again. And it featured uh, Spider Martin's photograph of, of John Lewis uh, and Josiah Williams and many civil, nonviolent civil rights activists. And we had the privilege of actually exhibiting that physical billboard in MoMA PS1. And in speaking to like just a few months later uh, in, in collaborating with the community to actually have discourse about the current moment of change that was happening there. Uh, and one of the things that I learned in that experience was the way in which MoMA proselytized for modern art through, under the leadership of Alfred Barr um, and sending out and loaning out exhibitions to, you know, Grand Rapids, Missouri and Lawrence, Kansas, um, and all of these museums that learned about what we now consider the canon of modern art through the activism and uh, I would say in the um, um, evangelism of uh, New York curators. We also were able to put a billboard outside of the MFA Boston that said, "Make a, uh, where do we go from here? Quoting the words of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King who said in his final speech, uh, where do we go from here, uh, chaos or community? Uh, these are places that I find very important. As at Four Freedoms, uh, we believe that uh, there is an incredible nexus between art, education, commerce, and politics uh, that is always in, at play because the people who have the uh, income to influence politics also have the income to influence and shape art. Uh, and a lot of that comes through their relationship to commerce. Um, uh, and so, and, and education, of course. So I believe that not only are the museums catalytic crucibles, uh, I believe that they do change the world. I believe that you all are incredibly powerful people. And I just gave you just a few examples a way which I can think that work that has happened under your tenure has changed the lives of several million people. Uh, I can't tell you what it was like for me as a young black man growing up in the Upper West Side of New York, going to the, to, to the Met and seeing virtually no images in the 1980s of African-Americans. Um, and there's one problem I still have with the Met, which is that Egypt is not considered part of Africa. We can talk about that later. <laughs> but that is to be an activist position uh, that in the way that art, is, it, it, art history is told, we don't actually create a continuity between the work that took place in Africa 2,000, 5,000 years ago, what's happening today. And so I think that um, that is, and I think it's also true, and I agree, I see, I agree with all of what you said. I just disagree with what you think is the responsibility. I, I, I believe that, that, that the, the ambitious mission of sustaining meaningful change uh, in museums, uh, which you all have overseen over the past several years is uh, a profound, permanent and perpetual uh, goal, which should be at the core of any political agenda. Uh, and I know this is like the best time to be a white man running a museum. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, and, and so um, I just wanna say that I acknowledge that you all have kind of done so much prior to the heat and I'm sure that now that the heat is on, that you're also thinking more. So thank you all for your work. Thank you, uh, everyone, for having me. And thank you for your work. I, I was uh, so impressed by how Hank was critical, but also diplomatic, because he was interacting with the, the three white men who were, were the, the three museum directors. Um, as we work with 
people like Hank and, and, and scholars uh, in art like Sarah Lewis at, at Harvard, we are, uh, we are keeping in mind that the great abolitionist and orator Frederick Douglass often argued for the importance of imagery in creating narratives that foster a pluralistic society. So we, we, we really mind Frederick Douglass in, in this work. Uh, but now let me move from visual arts to, to the performing arts and some of the events we've had there. Uh, for example, our 2021 uh, event with Bishop William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign focused on the role of song in creating new will. Uh, here is uh, some of what uh, Bishop Barber said about the importance of music in his moral fusion movement uh, with the Poor People's Campaign. So Reverend Barber, I'm going to start with you, um, but these, que these questions are for everyone. How has music been used to build the moral fusion movement and why is it so important? Well, first of all, I'm gonna, let me thank you and thank all of the people, the Mellon Foundation, Eisenhower, and of course the panelists uh, who are here and particularly um, Yara Allen and Sharon, uh, who are much more capable at, at drilling down in this because they embody it. Uh, and, and, and whenever you embody something, you're always more capable of, of, of identifying an expression. But having said that, there has never been a moral movement that did not have a rhythm. Sometimes, or music, sometimes it's the, the pain is so great you have to sing it before you can say it. You have to play it. You have to play in the minor key. But then sometimes the battle is so necessary. You have to play in another key, a key that gives you courage, a key that allows and you sing in a way that allows the people become one so that they can go out and face uh, sometimes what may be death. They sung in the Methodist church before they went across the Edmunds Betty's Bridge. Uh, and then sometimes you just have to sing as a way of enduring, uh, hold on just a little while longer. Um, but every movement, whether you look at when the Bible says, even when God was working, the morning stars sang together. Uh, Yara has taught me that even the spinning of the earth has a sound, has a rhythm. Um, we may not be able to hear it, but I once was looking at a program one night with, with people listening at space. Space has a sound if you can find the right uh, 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 instrumentation to hear it. Uh, when they came through the Red Sea, the first thing Miriam did was led the people in a song when Mary heard that she would be blessed and highly favored and what that would mean, would mean to have a child that would be challenged and eventually crucified, she sang. The prophets of ancient Israel were singers. If you read um, their lyrics, they almost sound like sixth century rap artists, hip hop artists, in the way in which they processed information. Jesus sang on the cross uh, uh, he was pulling up from the ancient psalm, the Hillel psalm, Psalm 111 to Psalm 118. Uh, the slave song, song. some person said that uh, the song Amazing Grace is one of the few songs that can be played with only the black keys. And they said that the writer who wrote that song, who later became an abolitionist, really picked that up from the moans and groans and the singing of the slaves that he heard in the slave ships. Um, and so singing uh, has always been more than singing, has indeed been theomusicology. Even our secular music has theo in it. When, when Prince talks about 1999, uh, if you look closely inside of that song, he's also referencing that which is divine. So we've had to sing the blues, we've had to sing the whole long, we've had to sing to get better. 
uh, there's an ancient text in the Bible, in the book of Kings, that says before the prophets can even preach, you have to bring forth the minstrel, bring forth the singers to create a certain prophetic atmosphere. Uh, you listen to Dr. King on the march on Washington. He was singing, I have a dream. He was literally singing that sermon. And the last night that he was with us, you know, I might not get there with you, but we, as of, he was, what um, uh, Yara and I used to talk about with Aretha, he was worrying the line. He was giving, he was, he was slowing the pace and singing the speech out in a way that it, it, it penetrated the soul, the minds, and the hearts of the people. And so for us to be a moral movement, we had to have a song. Not as an addition, not as a afterthought, but literally we have to teach people how to sing the issues, sing their pain, sing their power, sing their struggle, sing the battle, the battle hymn. And every 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 movement has to have a moral movement has to have a battle hymn. We won't be silent anymore. Somebody's hurting. Uh, but we won't be silent anymore. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on. Battle him. You know, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Battle him. Battle him. Uh, when you're going to take up nonviolent action, you don't have the weapons of the world. You have the weapons of a spiritual warfare that are not carnal, but they are mighty. Make them hear you make them hear you, one of the great songs of movement. And so in every way, um, I don't know of any place in history where you attempt to have a moral movement that is going to focus on love, justice, truth, liberation, that does not make you want to sing, that does not make you want to move in rhythm, that does not make you want to carry a tune, that does not make you want to hold arms and lock hands with other people and sing until the very walls of oppression tremble because they cannot understand how in the face of such aggression and oppression, we can still sing. Amen. Nobody. No. Shortly before he was assassinated in 1968, Dr. King was enhancing the civil rights movement by creating a movement for economic justice among all races and most classes. Bishop Barber carries this theme so well today. Music helps Bishop uh, Barber appeal to all races and to the poor workers and the middle class. Bishop Barber reaches out to the already converted to help motivate believers to continue the struggle. But he also advocates to independents, fence sitters, and to people actually opposed to Kerner uh, priorities. I think this is an important lesson for us. I challenge the Pri Privilege Institute to help us find ways to create new will among a diversity of audiences. While the words of Bishop Barber always give me hope, the obstacles to how the performing arts might create new will are painfully clear in Hollywood, in the film and television industry. This we discussed at our event with the Norman Lear Center for Entertainment, Media and Society at the Annenberg School at the University of uh, Southern California recently. Uh, Norman Lear, the creator of the television comedy All in the Family began that event and he reminded us that in July, he will be 100 years old. 
Uh, one of the panelists at, at the Annenberg and Clear event was Franklin Leonard, uh, who is founder of Blacklist. Uh, Blacklist uh, advocates for racial diversity in Hollywood. Uh, Franklin described how the film industry is the country's least diverse business sector. He documented how the talent of people of color has been systematically shut out of creator, producer, director, and writer positions in Hollywood. And here is more about what uh, Ms. Mr. Leonard uh, shared with us. But I actually don't think it's it's reasonable for us to judge the industry by the standard of 1965. I think the, the standard we have to judge the industry by is how it compares to other industries and how they've changed in America over the last 50 years. I think it is the most damning sort of statistic about Hollywood is that these the least diverse business sector in American business it is less diverse than finance it is less diverse than oil and gas um wow. and when you think about sort of that in the context of everything else you know I, I go back to um this quote by this that's often misattributed to plato but it's actually from like a 17th century poet uh named andrew fletcher let me write the songs of a nation and who will may make the laws right and obviously when he says songs, what he's talking about is the thing that is the lingua franca of culture and industry. It's not just songs. In our case, in 2022, it's movies and television. It's the stuff that most people consume. And it's not surprising to me that when you have the least diverse sector in American business writing the country's songs and in so doing writing the world's songs because of the nature of the way Hollywood exports these stories around the world, that you end up with a world that looks a lot like the world that we live in now, because those are the stories that we continue to tell, because those are the people that continue to choose what stories are being told. I also just going back to that McKinsey study for a second and sort of some a comment that Kenya made earlier about sort of the value of black life and the value of black stories. McKinsey put it in very clear terms. If you have a movie with a black lead you will get 24% less production budget on average. Mm -hmm. right? If you have a movie with two or more black off-screen principles, producer, director, writer, so a black story, you will get 40% less of a budget. That's just for the budget. And then you'll get less on marketing and distribution as well, roughly 10 to 15% depending. Despite that, dollar for dollar, black films make better ROI than so-called white films. We outperform in international territories, despite the fact that people assume you can't sell black right. films abroad on average. And I only just noticed this now, perhaps because we're talking about it in a sort of historical context. But what we're really talking about is black movies get 60% of what white movies get to make them, which is very ironically three fifths. And I know that makes me sound like a conspiracy theorist, but we're going to want to talk about the value of black lives and black stories. That rough 60% number seems to have echoes throughout history. I personally don't care if a bunch of white dudes decide they want to make a TV show. I just want to make sure that it's just as likely that a bunch of black women who want to do the same thing get exactly the same support when they show up with just as much merit as those, as those white dudes do. Mm -hmm. And I also want artists, frankly, to have the freedom to make the things as they want to see them made. I just don't think that the companies that are deciding what gets made and by whom are doing a great job in solving the problem. And in many ways, these policies lay off the blame on the creators when it actually is with the system. And the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is, I came to Hollywood because I want to make as much good film and television as humanly possible. And the only way we get there as a culture is by solving the problem of diversity. And it's notably also the fastest way we can make better stuff that has better business outcomes is to make sure that the people who are deciding what gets made and are making it actually look like the people who are consuming it and they never have. All of us can come up 
with our own uh, personal top 10 lists of films, uh, documentaries, and television programs that advocate, in effect, for new will. Uh, covering many decades, my own list, for example, includes The Raisin in the Sun, Do the Right Thing, Boys in the Hood, Selma, I Am Not Your Negro, The Hate You Give, Just Mercy, Riotsville, USA, and so many uh, PBS documentaries. And important new productions are emerging every day. But that is not the systemic change that Franklin Leonard is advocating. If Mr. Leonard's views are sobering, the vision of Mark by Muthi Joseph is inspiring. Mr. Joseph is a performing artist, leads a nonprofit organization, and is the vice president for social impact at the Kennedy Center in Washington. During our uh, Kerner uh, and Healing and New Will uh, panel with the Association of Performing Art Professionals, Mr. Joseph inspired us with his cartology, cartography project, which is developing uh, new Kennedy Center performances that are uh, created and undertaken uh, with creative artists of color. Mr. Joseph advocated for how the performing arts might inoculate his words, dignity into American culture in ways that create empathy and equity. Here is uh, more of what Mr. Joseph said. There's so much happening here. And um, what I'll add is um, I, um, like Roberta, uh, like Lisa, am, am working in at least five different avenues, um, five different channels. Um, I am um, the vice president and artistic director of social impact at the Kennedy Center. So I, I do have um, an institutional perch. Um, it, it's, uh, it's interesting working at an institution that has a federal adjacency uh, and working in this sector in that way. Um, there are some things that, quite frankly, um, I cannot do through my institutional perch that I am more able and have greater flexibility to do um, in my consultancy um, perch. So I've been hosting a series of um, workshops uh, called Healing Forward um, that are really about this idea of systemic allyship. The institutional goal, not unlike what Lisa is talking about with the 10, 20, 30 pledge, the institutional goal is to have a culture of systemic belonging um, that is measured quantitatively, is also measured qualitatively. Um, the, the mantra that I repeat over and over again is that we all want to be anti-racist, but but we also talk about structural racism. And if racism is structural, then anti-racism also must be structural. Um, so these, um, these uh, healing forward workshops um, kind of articulate a plan for arts workers, for folks working um, in the cultural sector um, to think about pipeline, pedagogy, programs and profiles um, as ways of developing this culture of systemic belonging or, or systemic allyship. And, and the next such workshop will be um, in a couple of weeks. Um, I am also in my artist body. And as a means of transitioning to our next um, piece, I want to ask a bunch of creative questions and um, then begin to talk about healing. So, um, so the, the questions pertain to some more institutional work that we're doing at the Kennedy Center, which is around the idea of um, dignity. Alan referenced 
that uh, that the Met in its 138 year history has just uh, presented or begun to present its first opera by a Black um, composer. And working at the Kennedy Center, uh, I have the privilege of working in the realm of classical music too. And um, these are some of the questions that have launched a, a, a piece that we're working on there called the Cartography Project. Um, the questions begin, what if dignity were currency? And our business model depended on spinning the capital of dignity into the capital of finance. What if when we said equity, we didn't mean everybody's in the house, we meant equity like what you have if you own your house. We invested in inclusion to produce equity for diverse communities, which means more than putting on shows or producing symbols. Though the matter of Black life itself is controversial, surely Black dignity couldn't possibly be cause for alarm. What if all this dis-ease was a prompt for an entrepreneurial reframe, like the explosion of crypto as currency? What if we treated the art of cultivating dignity as an intentional economy? If the product were empathy and you had to make it, and you had to make it mass accessible, what raw materials would you use? What if dignity were currency and the raw material to make it was culture? What if you worked at a cultural mint and you printed white walls and bright lights in the aesthetic sublime 80% of the time, but 20% of every dime was spent minting cultural equity for the historically left behind. Equity, not like proportional balance, equity like profit on your PNL balance. Who in this country is manufacturing empathy? Just a little bit. And in the end, wouldn't we all benefit? What if dignity were medicine? were a vaccine and the public and private sector teamed up to invest in our collective healing and our country's cultural mints were the place where anybody could get pricked with a sharp edge of culture, a chemical boost included us all because we've just learned that if I'm healthy and you're sick, I'm at risk. Why risk emerging from this moment in a culturally unhealthy way? Why put a cultural inflection point to waste? What if the product were collective healing and in order to do it, we had to practice more cooperative economics, except no one would buy it if it wasn't fly. So to heal, we had to invest in artists, invested in their individual projects, but used artist intellect to mass produce dignity and put as much equity in it as you would a non-fungible token of a digital object. We make value. Diversity is not a stock to be left alone to accrue. Diversity is a paper thin bill that you got to keep stacking or else you're not serious. What if you were making a city? My friend Deborah Cullinan always asks, how many great artists does it take to make a great city? How many artists does it take to make America great? If you had equity stakes in empathy, who would you invest in first? In the ecosystem of cultural production, what if we all win, if we all win? What if we didn't all have to win? We just all remembered when the world was sick and collective healing was something we were all invested in. What if nobody got left behind? What if we healed forward cardinal directions, truth, dimension, humanity, access, latitudes of public imagination, longitudinal public policy, X, Y, Z, axis, access the ancestors, call their names, map the future, collective dignity, the moral compass, invest in the road forward, use culture as brick and walk the walk. That was very much thematically aligned with what the Smithsonian Museum directors were telling us. And the notion of mass producing dignity and empathy is to say the least, profound and uh, 
this is just the beginning of how we uh, create a narrative to advance that process. And we could probably spend the next three hours uh, discussing what Mark has just said. Um, we've had other events uh, with uh, performing visual arts that we don't have time to get into today, for example, with LULAC and with the International Hip Hop Museum, and they provide uh, different perspectives. Uh, and now the, the Eisenhower Foundation is, is planning to, to try to bring uh, the visionaries uh, like Mark, uh, like Franklin Leonard, uh, like Hank, like Bishop Barber, uh, like Sarah Lewis at, at Harvard, and the Smithsonian directors uh, together to, to, to essentially proceed in the direction that Mark has been talking about, but to try to collaborate uh, nationally uh, to uh, create a movement that brings all of their brilliance uh, together and moves forward. Uh, what can we achieve? We're not sure yet. Uh, we believe that the visual and performing arts at the least uh, can be a significant force uh, for racial diversity, for voters' rights, and against voter suppression. But how far can we extend beyond that? Uh, we really really need your feedback and ideas then on, on the potential of the visual and the performing arts and of museum culture and in creating new will and in furthering the priorities of the current commission at a point in time uh, when American democracy is so threatened and so divided. The creation uh, of new will in America seems daunting. I ask you, finally today, to be inspired by the national will being shown by the people of Ukraine. The arts embolden, the arts inspire. And so in harmony with our theme uh, this morning, it was moving to me earlier this week when the great cellist Yo-Yo Ma protested outside the Russian embassy in Washington by playing the Ukrainian national anthem. So thank you for your time, and I turn this back over to Tracy now. Thank you, Alan, uh, for that presentation. So what we wanna do at this point is have our question and answer portion. You can feel free to submit questions through the chat but if you'd like to just ask your question on screen, we also, you know, would like to have that dialogue as well. So whichever you see fit for yourself, feel free. Hi, my name is Julianne and I'm joining from Berkeley, California and I'm outside Hi. on my front porch. <laughs> Hi. But I, I'm just so happy to be here with the small room that we have and that was a great, um, I really appreciated all the different ways that you showed people talking about how they're doing that work. And I, um, I'm an arts educator at uh, elementary school in Berkeley, called the Berkeley School. And um, I just got to go to the National Art Education Association conference in New York City, which was last week. And um, Hank spoke there too. Um, but I've been working with the Four Freedoms Group for uh, about two and a half years right now also, and working with my young students on um, connecting civic engagement with what they can do to help like voter registration, even as a kindergartner. And how can you help people, um, help your family understand how important it is that voting is one of our civic rights. So I just, um, I have a lot more people to look up now that you shared those. I really appreciate being here and, um, you know, even if I can't be in, in uh, live with all you, I'm very happy to be here right now. So thank you so much. I appreciate that, that feedback. Uh, we, we still are trying to figure out how far we, we can go with this. Uh, and we, we, the, advocating for diversity in Hollywood, advocating for voter rights are easy. And, and maybe that's that's 
all. Uh, but when you start listening to Mark, Joseph, then you, you get into something that's more profound. How, how you take what Mark Joseph said and uh, operationalize it, we don't know. I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be interested in, in, in your ideas for, for how to, to actually make it happen every day. I could imagine bringing that to my young students and asking them those questions. I was like feverishly writing down his questions. So I'll, I'll go to the clip that I, when I get sent and, and really pose those questions to young students because they actually have a lot of, um, they have a lot of good ideas. And he was using the, he was using the metaphor of, of capitalism Okay, that's that's one thing. But I prefer the metaphor of, of, of healing to, to inoculation, um, and it seems to me we we might uh, we might take that metaphor and uh, create progress uh, along the lines we're talking about. I, I don't know if, if we can actually get all these visionaries to collaborate on focus projects and I think that to me is another another big issue. I know Hank and Sarah Lewis are big friends with each other and Hank is the biggest collaborator I've ever known to be, bring just all kinds of people together and his generosity of spirit is is incredible. Yeah he really is inspiring and uh, We'll, we'll be working with Sarah. She had a, a car accident, and so she she wasn't able to uh, to uh, work when we were with uh, Hank at our event. But uh, now that she's getting better, uh, we will we will proceed, and we will actually show her all these clips and say, "Okay, Sarah, what are you going to do about it?" The um, wonderful, wonderful presentation. And um, yeah, I'd like to really get a hold of those clips so I can see it, you know, and um, really absorb. It was so much to absorb and amazing. Those uh, healing uh, forward workshops, particularly, mm -hmm. thing, yeah, mm -hmm. is there any way that we can get any more information on that too, I would like to. Thank you all for your your patience, and uh, let's let's try to build on this in the future.